Hi friends, host oh, Derek here, host Tyler McMaster. Let me see if I can respond to this in a video before I take a nap here today. XZ asks, there's a little, what we call deconstruction in general. Number one, can an experience be unobserved? Mm, yes. Sure. Uh, well, it can be observed only experientially, in which case no no record of it is kept, so to speak. If not, then why does an experience need to be rendered as an object to be communicated? Well, see, that's the thing. For experience to be remembered or meaningful in some way, you have to assign it static representations of it rather than the thing itself. You can't sustain the thing itself beyond the duration of the thing itself. Um, it is not the case that all that is observed is an object. This is the number one mistake here in XD's comment. Experience is distinct from objects. So, having a stomach ache is not an object. Talking to the words having a stomach ache, those are objects. Referring to it for communication purposes, that renders it into an object. But actually having a stomach ache does not, is not an object. That's an experience. It has duration. It's felt subjectively. To be an object is to be something that is objective, not inherently of the subject. So, what's inherently of the subject? A stomach ache. Of the subject made. But when I talk about it, I have to render that experience into communicative objects so that you can understand what I'm saying. No, when we talk about observation and experience, we're using an objective representation of those things. So it's very important we don't mistake the symbol for the thing, or vice versa, and be very careful with understanding how language is used. In, in this instance, you got to be careful not to mistake um, your talking about experience for experience itself. Experience is not an object, but every time we talk about it, we have to render that experience into an object before we talk about it, okay? Number two, if to observe is to make a distinction, how do you make sense of the experience reported by experienced mediators of perceiving the subject, the experience of self, the field, and the objects as one in a state of extreme focus? That experience is an observation, yet here distinction is dissolved and disappear. Okay, so, um, no, to observe is definitely to make a distinction, right? So, um, but whether or not the distinction is renders an object is a different question. So, for example, I experientially, or as part of my process, I'm making distinctions as I'm, say, freestyling a song. Freestyling a song might be considered to be this a moment of that uh, coalescence into some fields and not others, blah, blah, blah. What you describe here as how do you make sense of the experience reported of perceiving the subject, the experience itself, the field, and the objects as one in a state of extreme focus? Um, well, first of all, that you're, you're talking about a subjective experience that people are attempting to render into objects for communicative purposes. And you're saying, how do you account for this objective experience in which observation appears to not make distinctions? Well, even that's a distinction. It's deviating from the norm, right? That experience. It's memorable because of the fact that it deviates from the norm. That's why these people who experience it turn it into an object and discuss it. Um, on what do you base your conclusion that moral agents have the responsibility to be ethical? Okay, well, uh, put it this way. That's a tricky question to answer. Foremost, I would say, is something of an ontological proof, which is, it is indisputable that people behave in ways that get evaluated on moral criteria by other agents at least. That's indisputable. So if I do something wicked, I will be judged by others as having done something wicked. So the, the moral vector exists. In other words, there is a distinction between normative and prescriptive statements. And what it refers to specifically is the moral consideration. And um, you're saying, well, well, how do you, what is your, on what do you base your conclusion that people have a responsibility to be ethical? It's implicit to the, to the, to the existence of the framework 
because there's a distinction between that which is served my own interest and that which is ethically acceptable, then it, the, the definition more of a moral agent is that which has the obligation to be ethically acceptable. If they're not, then they're not. What are the consequences for that? Well, you incur a status of, of behaving in a morally impermissible way. Uh, now, what, what, on what do I base my conclusion that moral agents have a responsibility to be proactively ethical rather than just negatively ethical? Negative ethics is definitionally implicit as, as the good. It's, it's what we comprise as the good. That's what it means to, to say something is normative is to say that there is a good and that which deviates from it. Um, if you're going to make any arguments about uh, moral agency, then you acknowledge right off the bat that moral agency is something about which you make arguments. And as a consequence, you acknowledge right off the bat that moral agency is something about which people can incur statuses or, or lose or win arguments about statuses. So as a consequence, on that level, the negative aspect of moral agency is, is, is one where it's kind of built on reciprocal burdens, I guess, where you say, uh, if you want to be able to claim a, a, any kind of right to uh, any kind of rights if you, if you want to claim that behavior of mine can be either wicked or, or not wicked namely that uh, burning you to death with you know uh, causing your death in, an, in a murderous fashion is wicked then um, then you have no right to then expect... If, if you don't respect my right for that, you have no right to expect that for yourself. If you have that expectation, then you have an obligation to, by, by the mechanism of reciprocal burdens, to afford me the same right. You might say, well, by, which, by what standard do you justify reciprocal burdens? Well, the fact that you're arguing about this, that's, that's the way we justify it. We go, okay, well, look, we're, we're exercising reciprocal burdens here. There's no way to make discussions that include justifications for things without incorporating reciprocal burdens because once you decide to justify rather than force, you are now engaging in discourse. And discourse is going to... Um, nobody's going to think discourse is just, fair, or good unless there's reciprocal burdens being met. In other words, if you can make the argument, I can make the argument too. That kind of argument. So, um, uh, as far as the positive or proactive ethical obligation, that is derived from, from magical thinking. So I'm, I'm not saying I can sustain that as a, as a deductively sound conclusion. I'm saying that because we can't make deductively sound conclusions about positive moral indications, we have to use magical thinking as a framework if we want to have any conclusions about them at all. Whether or not you think we ought to have any conclusions about positive moral indications or not, that's entirely up to you because, once again, it's not something I can deductively defend as universal. Okay? So... Uh, number four, what is your definition of experience as opposed to observation and existence? Okay, so look, experience is is that which is subjective. Namely, it has duration. It um, it doesn't require objectification to be understood. It doesn't necessarily need to be communicated. Now, um, and, and it, it may not be possible to meaningfully communicate it because it's experiential. Uh, what's observation? Observation is is the process of um, of being, basically, but it's not necessarily experiential. It could be communicative. In other words, we have a metaphysical plane in which observation exists. That's what's happening right here. I am observing your thing, and I am responding to it. Am I experiencing it? Well, I am experiencing... Uh, sure, when I'm reading it, I'm experiencing it in that moment. And in that instance, experiencing it... And uh, uh, interacting with the, object, the objects that you've presented are the same thing. But then once I'm done experiencing it, now I'm acting upon it. That's a little bit different than experiencing your words. I'm now acting upon them. Different things. Have I, am I still working off the observation of your words? Sure. Am I still observing it? No. Am I still making what are known as observations? Yes, I'm making observations. Um, but nevertheless, I'm not... Am I experiencing my own observations? Well, no. The observations are objects that are distinct from experience. What I'm saying is, let's remove ourselves from the experiential plane, where things aren't objects, where time really matters. In other words, it sort of matters here, but um, the point is, I'm, there's no arbitrary time limit at which point, if I don't, if I don't kick a goal, I'm going to lose the game, right? Uh, nothing unobserved exists. Correct. It's not possible to exist 
that that is observation and existentiality. In other words, existentiality, for the purposes of communication or experience, supervenes on on observation. Which means you can't have the former without having the latter first. Okay. Uh, this is a positive claim on which you can't possibly have a basis for. It is true that nothing unobserved can be known, but whether or not that which is not observed exists or not cannot possibly be known. <laughs> um, well, that assumes, see, this is, this is a mistake where you think you can render an object for something unobserved. You're saying it's possible that existence could be unobserved. But anytime you try to come up with any single example of it, you have to observe it first. So the thing is, you're trying to extend the definition of a word into that which it might include. In other words, because we know this exists, we know there might be things that exist that we don't know about, right? Well, I know that there are things that I that might exist that I don't know about. I can anticipate that meaningfully. I can go seek out things I don't know about and learn of their existence. There's no dispute in that. It's, the problem is, you, you're thinking in terms of a we that is is not really an observer. So um, what I'm saying, every time you become aware of something, it's been observed. There, there's nothing you will ever be aware of that's not been observed. And as far as you're concerned, as far as I'm concerned, as far as each individual person concerned, existentiality comes after or concurrent with observation. So because existence only occurs conceptually or otherwise, within an observer, um, it, it is uh, either a perfect correlation with observation and the existence of moral agency, or is a uh, prerequisite to it. So, I mean, I mean or that the, uh, the observation and prerequisite to existentiality. So that's, that's the important thing to remember is the reason I can make this claim is because it's so easy to negate. All you have to do is come up with one example. But the problem you have is it's definitionally impossible to come up with an example. It's not physically impossible. You're mistaking physical logic with definitional logic, okay? And recognize that the objective half of the, the frame here, the metaphysical half, is made out of words that have definitions. It is not, they are representations of things. Don't expect the map to be the territory and don't expect the territory to be the map. What is your understanding of the process of making an observation? Well, I mean, there's lots of kinds. The thing is, making an observation is, um, it, it can be, it, it, there's a lot of different ways in which people can observe. That's what cognitive functions does. You could say that, um, that cognitive functions represent a taxonomy of, of manners of observation rather versus, versus manners of attention. Same thing, okay? Observation and attention is basically the same thing. If I'm attending via um, extroverted sensing, I am observing in the sense of uh, realizing this 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 guy's go coming at me from over here so quickly, jolting left on the on the soccer field with the soccer ball. That's an ob that's observing, but it's not easy to talk about as observations because it's not the kind of observing that renders necessarily into objects, unless the specific instance of the experiential process or fluid process of moving through time and space with objects is notable for some reason, it might not be objectified. So step number 300 uh, in the marathon is not going to be rendered into any kind of an object. It's just going to experientially happen. I might reference this abstract notion of step 300 in a marathon in an abstract notion of somebody making notes of important points of while they're running a marathon. But again, what's happening here with you is you're mistaking map for territory all the time and getting confused and insisting map be territory and territory be map. They are functioning according to different rules you need to accept and understand that. Um, if, if you want to be right. I think the way you talk about meaning makes the distinction between meaningfulness and importance less clear than it really is. How do you differentiate between the two? Uh, meaning is simply... Uh, is, is the communication of something. Now, what's communicated is is what's important here. Sometimes what's communicated is a physical thing that can be easily and concretely understood as representational of something. So if I say, 
look at that rock over there and point to a rock, you understand that rock is a representation of that thing. That rock means, means the thing you're observing right now with your eyes. You're seeing with your eyes, right? It's easy then to be very clear about the connection between the symbol and the, the thing itself. But if I'm talking to you about map territory dynamics, that's a metaphor in and of itself. What I'm saying is that within our metaphysical understanding of things, language is a grand map by which we can understand uh, the territory of our experiences, uh, some of which are very map-steeped experiences. Like, this is a very map-steeped experience. So it's gonna, it, it gets very meta very fast, and you've got to keep clear the distinction between map and territory. These words we use to talk about, about cognitive functions, are not, are not a real-time kind of function, which is to say, it doesn't matter if I say these words a little bit faster or a little bit slower, if I intone them differently, the real-time expression of them is not what contains the meaning or the, conve the, uh, the conveyance of definition that the words, the words do. Now, to be a fully understanding of meaning conveyance, you have to also incorporate the illocutionary plane as well as the locutionary. The locutionary plane is what the words mean objectively as you say them. The illocutionary plane includes factors of why the person says those words, and that is something that FE is concerned about. So another party's understanding of these words also includes the other party's understanding of the other party's illocutionary frame, and things get complicated very fast. But the point is, um, the way, what I mean by meaning is basically the, the thing that a word has that allows that word to convey an approximation of something, again, not necessarily an experience. This is where, this is why it gets complicated to explain, right? Um, and that meaning making, for example, if I say intuitard, I am referring to something, a phenomenon or a class of behaviors that might be classified as intuitives, um, being too intuitive to see what's right in front of them, um, doing dumb stuff because their head's in the cloud, that kind of thing, right? It was a phenomenon that needed a quick and easy term. So what does that term show? It shows what's called meaning packing. The term intuitive refers to a group of different things that uh, the people that correlate with intuitives being out of touch with concrete matters. Um, you might say, well, okay, so, I mean, I don't, I don't know what you're, what you're trying to get at here. It should, it should be pretty clear what I mean. I, I'm not, I'm not just talking out my ass or, or just, or just saying things for no reason. I'm making these distinctions, they're, they're significant distinctions. What's the difference between observation and paying attention? Not much. I think observation and paying attentional manner and observational manner are indistinguishable terms. And uh, I mean, interchangeable terms. Observation and attention are the same thing. And they operate in the same way in that observation is not necessarily only paying concrete, willful attention. There's, there's channels of attention that, that, you know, it's complicated, but you guys know. Anyway, the thing is, hopefully that answers your question about existentiality and um, um, experience and observation and, and objects versus sub subjective things. Subjective things, uh, you know, the song, a song that I put up, God of Rock, let's say, that I, I, I posted in the video, that has a concrete duration it exists as an entity in people who know the song in their mind and they kind of have some sense of what they're going to anticipate. But to, uh, to, but the purpose of a song is to experience it and to experience it more than once. So if you're going to experience it, you have to actually put in the duration. You can know it as an object without listening to it. You can have some gist of what it sounds like without listening to it. But you can't um, experience listening to it without listening to it. Uh, in contrast, if I um, if I have a talking thing, uh, I really can experience basically the whole thing without experiencing it again because it, I can tell you what all of the I could memorize the words, for example, or um, I can't, whereas I can't memorize the multiple parts of a song and perform them concurrently. If I memorize the words of a page of text, then 
recite it, that's the same thing as reading the page of text in terms of experience of the meanings. Uh, okay, so that's it. Uh, hopefully that cleared things up rather than making things more complicated. It's, I hate arguing about this stuff. I really do. I really do. Because um, XZ, it's like, I, I don't mean to be so aggro in my response to this. I respect your question. It's it's a well considered question, and um, it just frustrates me. I don't know. I get frustrated because I've explained this thing a million times before, and people either don't get it or don't get it. For people who are or more TI valuing. They're gonna, they're gonna question it in a more specific way. Like, I don't know, it's hard to explain. Blah, 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 blah. This is like depressing, you know? I find, I find this kind of thing depressing because I don't want to be always defending dissembling. And this kind of thing, trying to trying to blur the distinction between experience and object. Um, why, if not, why does a an experience need to be rendered into an object to be communicated? Since all what is observed in, is an object in the first place, it's not true that all observation is that it observes an object. You can observe your own your own physical experience, as I said. Uh, without rendering it into an object, or with rendering it into an object. Rendering it into an object means rendering it into something that's communicable. So I mean, we begin with this sort of like basic misunderstanding of either what I'm saying or um, or something, then um, it makes it frustrating because I'm, I get what you're I get what you're trying to do in general, but it's not helpful to try to remove the the meaning from distinctions that are meaningful. Things like experience and words about experience are different. You know? And they just are. So I don't know. The end.